Welcome to another episode of Subject to Interpretation, a podcast from the De La Mora Institute of Interpretation. Today we have the distinct pleasure of being at the 44th Annual Conference for the National Association of Judiciary Interpreters and Translators, and I have my dear friend Hilda Schmanick here to talk to us a little bit about a few things Najid and a few things Hilda. So Hilda, welcome. Thank you, thank you for having me. Appreciate being here. Well, you know, it's an absolute pleasure to be interviewing you here at Nagit. And the reason for that is that I've been coming to the Nagit conference, I don't know, like seven, eight, nine, ten years, probably about the last ten years in a row, except for obviously COVID, where it was virtual. And at every conference, you have been this one constant that I have always really enjoyed seeing. And it's amazing that you have been working in different areas behind the scenes, in front of the scenes. You have been, I believe you have been in the um, conference committee. You have been on the board. You have been treasurer of Najit. Tell me all of these different things that you have been involved in in Najit over the last couple of years. Tell me about that. I would love to. Um, well. Um and I'm going to go a little bit further, but I'm going to be fast. Okay. I, uh, I um, started working with the Conference Committee um, years ago, and um, then I became a board member, and then I joined the Advocacy Committee, too. And um, what else? Uh, I've been treasurer and now vice chair, and now I'm co-chairing the Conference Committee with um, Fran, Fran Samuels. And um, I also, for a time, was in the Training and Education Committee. Wow. So I think you've pretty much covered every single aspect there is to cover in, in Nagit. I'm part of the blog, too. So. <laughs> ah, OK. So we're going we're gonna to get to that. So, so the, first, the first thing I want to let folks know is that um, you are on the current Nagit board. Correct. And that you're cycling off. That's correct. Saturday. Saturday. So this is a, a big moment for um, for Hilda. I, and I'd probably say just because, um, are you going to stay with Nagit working in any, some kind of capacity? I'm hoping so. I, I was uh, having a conversation with my colleagues yesterday. Hopefully that will happen. Yes, I would love to. Okay. Well, I know that a lot of people have really enjoyed your blogs. Um, you recently did a great blog. Um, well, you do great blogs all the time. Um, and so, but recently the one that you did um, on doubling down on yourself. Tell me about that because obviously that's part of the, that's part of the theme of this year's conference of double down on yourself, get what you are worth, which I think is, is really critical for us interpreters, freelance or staff interpreters, translators, um, agency owners, and um, educators. It's, it's critical that we take charge of our own um, career path and, and our own earnings potentials so that we can um, really be the consummate professionals and be seen as the professionals that we actually are. So tell me about a little bit about that blog because I read it with a lot of interest and I really, I, I also thought it got a lot of good response. Thank you. Well, I, I see this profession as undervalued and I sometimes have noticed that a lot of my colleagues are not getting what they're worth because they're not aware. And part of that awareness is the, their shortcomings. We have weaknesses and we have to work on those so that we can feel that worth. And I, I encourage people to join conferences, to join you know, training education, um, workshops, all sorts of things that will better themselves so they can feel their worth. But at any level that you're at, you have to know what you're worth and what this career is worth. And whether you are very experienced or not, if you're certified, you are at the level that all interpreters stare at. So your, your fees, your compensation has to um, equal that, in my opinion. I was very interested because, you know, there's always this kind of controversy as to whether one should publish rates, not publish rates, talk about how much one earns, one wants to earn, one should charge, one should earn. And, and your blog was, was very interesting in that you didn't talk about what you charge, but you did talk about your the different levels of earnings that you work towards. And I believe, you know, at one point you were talking about you were making 10 or plus more thousand dollars a month, which is 
you know, a wonderful living, in my opinion, um, especially coming from a staff interpreter. <laughs> um, but, you know, you were talking about that, and you were talking about how you got to that. And, and I think it's, it's, it's really important. I think that, um, you know, you can make ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a month, you know, by working 150 hours a week, or you might even be able to make that by working 60 hours a week or 40 hours a week. It all depends on how you organize yourself. Can you talk a little bit about that transition where you had to, you know, say, okay, I need this minimum to live, but I really think that I should be bringing in um, by having quality clients, by having, you know, not having a lot of wasted time, by making sure my cancellation clauses are, you know, considered and honored. Talk to me about that. Well, I invested in somebody that books me, and that's changed everything because I was missing a lot of assignments because I was not available. So now that I have someone that books me, that made a big difference because I could take a lot more assignments and also gave me the opportunity to have time off. Like Wednesday mornings, I want them off. Um, I have my grandchildren, I want to do other things, I have a personal life. And um, having, investing the money on a person that books me, it, it's a big deal. How does that work? Well. Um, this person has access to, and it's the simplest thing, it's not a complicated thing. It's an Excel worksheet where I have, I put everything that I'm doing from my hair to, so that nothing, you know, gets um, double booked. So at five o'clock I'm doing this, at seven I'm doing this, and um, this individual comes and um, has access, we share this um, worksheet and puts everything I, I'm doing. So can respond immediately um, if some courthouse wants me for a five-day trial, has access, responds, and I'm booked. And I don't have to do anything. Nobody comes to me anymore. They go to him. So how is this person somebody who knows about the interpreting profession? Yes. Okay. And has my rates and has my cal shares my calendar. You know, like a secretary. But much. it's not an agency? No. No. So you pay her a rate, whatever it is, yes. her fee for management. It's like you would pay any other yes. consultant. Yes, absolutely. Well, you know, this is a perfect example of doubling down, isn't it? The idea of doubling down is you're at the craps table or you're at the poker table mm -hmm. and, you know, you've got a bet and then you think you've got a good hand or you want to risk earning more. And so you double down, you, you know, you put more money down to, you know, with the expectation that the risk reward is going to be, you know, in your favor. And in this case, by you deciding that you were going to take part of your income to pay for this booker, it seems like you have really, you know, you've really gotten your money's worth. Absolutely. Yes. So how do you recommend somebody find a booker <laughs> as opposed uh, to a bookie, <laughs> you know, a booker, not bookie, guys, even though we're in Las Vegas, okay? <laughs> Email me. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, well, you know, just there's an app that has, um, you know, freelancers, and I found someone that had the time that um, was willing to, and then we can work a rate, but it's, it's a freelancer like myself. So what happens if you get someone, if somebody contacts you, you send them an email or you forward that directly to your booker and then your booker, um, and then your booker takes it on and follows up with it? Or how do you do that? No, from the very beginning, I, every time somebody offered me a job, this is what's the, you know, the first month, say, um, and I would copy this person and say, this person is gonna be in charge with me uh, of all my bookings. So from now on, anything that you wanna offer, go straight to this person. So everyone, the courthouses, you know, is the only non-interpreter in these distribution lists. Wow. Yes. That is, and how'd you get this idea? That's a fabulous idea. I don't know. Just looking at freelance, you know, websites, looking for opportunities. Mm -hmm. I found that and I just thought, hmm, this would be smart. And then some friends started to reach out and say, hey, can you, can you connect me with your booker? And that's how this started. Well, that, that, that is fabulous because, you know, we don't, here we don't have the ethical dilemma of this thing where, you know, somebody's calling you and saying, hey, can you do this? And, you know, by the way, I need a cut. Mm -hmm. which, which, of course, is, is something that, in my mind, is controversial. I mean, if you're an agency and you, pay, and you charge for a service, which is to book, to bill, to pay the interpreter, that is fine. I have difficulty understanding why, if I have a job that I can't take and I send it over to you, I should expect a cut from that job. That, to me, is 
not ethical. Um, but this is different. This is just yes. a, it's a job. It's a job. Yeah, it's a job. And um, he does my billing and everything. I don't have to do any of that administrative part, which allows me to do translations. So if I want to practice, if I want, I mean, it's. So everybody who's listening out there, you know, this is, you know, this is a game changer for me. Um, I'm currently staff, but if I were to go back to um, freelancing, that's actually one of the reasons that makes me feel like, you know, maybe I just won't have enough time to run the business. I want to interpret. So if I want to interpret and I don't necessarily want to run a business, then there's ways around it and you just have to be creative to see what actually works for you. And, and Hilda, thank you so much for sharing that. That's um, really, really quite amazing. So uh, before we go, um, how do you feel about this journey you've been on with Nagit? How have you seen it grow in the last few years? And how do you feel about this kind of transitioning off the board? Because it's obviously not your first time on the board, right? No, it's my first time. No. <laughs> not your first rodeo, right? It's my third. <laughs> third time yes. on the board. So for everybody who's wondering, can I be on the board? Can I participate? Yes, you can. You can come. You can go. You can take care of your family, your kids, if they're growing up and then once you've taken care of those responsibilities you can always come back there's there's lots of places to, for you to participate in yeah absolutely well you know it's uh I'm ambivalent I feel excited about having more time because it takes a lot of dedication a lot of time but I'm also going to miss it um it helped me grow as a person all the networking all the relationships that, that, that you um all the people you need to get to meet and also I think importantly the the work you learn about all these different um, entities that are working towards the betterment of, of our profession and you just get to know different associations different groups and um, you know all that knowledge you can use it in your professional career so you're going to miss the weekly board meetings or the monthly board meetings? I am. You are? <laughs> I am. My colleague. She know? says <laughs> yes. Her eyes say no. I'm not quite sure what I'm, you know, which to, what to what to interpret. Um, so Hilda, how do we um, how do we encourage new members who are coming into this conference to participate in other ways outside when once the conference is over? Well, um, they can volunteer. They can uh, sign up at the front desk with Susan and Rob, uh, Rob Cruz. Uh, Rob, uh, our executive director, is now also our volunteer coordinator, and he has a, a, a plan. This is something very new, signed last week, and um, so he will help guide people to the niche, to the program, to the project where they will fit in, and um, uh, we, we just encourage people because this is a privilege it's a benefit of members. We do have once in a while um, a, a person, a participant that is there um, as an expert, a consultant, but this is primarily a benefit for members. So Excellent. join us. Yeah. So what else would you like to tell us about the conference this year? Um, well, we have a lot of different events and projects. Um, one of the big things and um, that we've been talking about, we would like to have more people gather locally so we have um we're going to have four stations for the geographical areas that we're covering it's four of them and people will gather there to network and start trying to have more grassroots um uh, projects and also you know meet and greets and uh just gatherings um also start having local workshops um and uh i don't know maybe you know just also liaise with the conference when they come to your area. A lot of different ideas. Well, it sounds like there's a lot of um, extending. There's you know a lot of branches that are um, coming out to engage people in, in different regions. And I guess maybe um, bring us back together after you know a difficult period of being so um, so separated um, because of the COVID um, nineteen um, pandemic and, and and the crisis. Yes, Hilda. Um, I, I mean, I love seeing you at these conferences. I, are you going to keep on coming back? 
all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. So everybody, thank you so much for joining us and watching um, this. Um, it's been a pleasure talking to my friend Hilda Shimanik. Um, she is um, a state certified interpreter um, and a translator, a business owner, um, has um, held many leadership positions in um, the Nadjid Association as well as other associations in other states, um, New Jersey, New York, and so on and so forth. We expect that she's going to be doing a lot of great things um, to continue, um, not just for her career, but also for the association and um, mentoring other um, upcoming and um, new interpreters who are, are going to be joining us in the near future. If you're watching us and you haven't been able to participate in the NAGIC conference this year, uh, not to worry. There's always next year. Please keep an eye on the, uh, on the newsletters and the blogs. The information will be coming back up. I believe next year we're in Rhode Island, Providence, Correct. Rhode Island. So you heard it here first. We're going to be here in Providence, Rhode Island, and also um, De La Muda Institute of Interpretation is very involved in promoting membership of the NAJIT Association, a National Association of Judiciary Interpreters and Translators. So go to our website, um, DeLamoraInstitute.com, check out the blogs, check out the courses, check out the podcast subject to interpretation, send us your notes, send us your comments, and um, ask what you can do um, to become a NAJIT member and how you can benefit from the many benefits and the privilege that it is to be a, um, a member of NAJIT and a volunteer where you get to have access to a lot of really amazing people whose pretty much their only goal in life is to help other interpreters. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much everybody. You take care now. Thank you for having me. Yeah. It's a pleasure. Thank you.